Hello and welcome to episode 53 of the Crash and Ride podcast. I'm Patrick Ferguson. I'm your host. Today's guest is John Macbeth, a guitar player, singer, songwriter, a metal guy, really super heavy guy, good friend of mine, and a true survivor. Just wait till you hear this guy's story. It's unbelievable. I'm so proud of this episode. You, you may be asking yourself, though, Patrick, why is this episode 28 hours late? Well, I can explain. I realized that last week I said, you know what, everything's going to be great from now on. I'm going to be on time. Everything's going to be perfect. I'm going to do better. And a funny thing happened. Um, I was all set up to do an interview Friday night with a guy who I've known about for years. We've met a couple times, and he's a singer-songwriter, and I knew he had some time on him, uh, as in sobriety. Um, I also knew that he had a lot of wild times behind him, and I wanted to get all of that down and talk about it because I thought he'd be really good on the program. So I, I contacted him, and he was in town to do some shows and um, set up a time. And because I knew it wasn't going to be a great time for us to get uninterrupted time at my house, I went ahead and called the owner of the studio where I used to work, and I, I, I said, look, man, I want to come in there and, and, and do an interview, and I'll use my own gear. I don't need anything but the big live room and a table, and I'll do the rest. And um, he said, sure, great, no problem. Um, we hadn't seen each other in a while. He was sort of stoked to have me come by the studio and hang out a little bit. But when I got there, there was a session running late, and they kind of bumped into our time a little bit, and that put me back a bit. But the guy I wanted to interview was early. So I was like, you know what? Let's just go for a walk. There's a Mexican grocery store around the corner. We'll get we'll get some drinks and some snacks and come back. And um, on the walk, he was like, so tell me about this podcast. I was like, okay, well, it's a mental health podcast for musicians. We talk about depression, anxiety, addiction. And I know you've been down some of those roads, and I know you got some time on you. I thought you'd be a great guest. And he got real quiet. We walked about a block, and he was like, um, yeah, about that sobriety thing. And it turns out that, you know, dude hasn't been doing so great lately. And I was like, you know what? I'm I'm cool with that. I think that it could still be a great interview. I just, just tell the truth because that's what this is all about, right? We're just going to tell the truth. And he said, yeah, I, st I still want to do it, you know. But then we got back, I set up, we got going, and, and the clock was running. He had to be somewhere, and like it was a really intense interview. We got deep, fast, and we were talking about all the crazy shit that he's been up to and how crazy it's been. And then like 30, 45 minutes into it, he's like, I, I, I got to go. And so I packed up really quick, and I, and, I, and I drove over to where he was standing, picked him up, and um, I was driving him downtown to meet the people he was supposed to meet uh, that night. And he said to me, you know, if I do this podcast, there's going to be a lot of people who find out for the first time that I'm not sober right now. And, uh, I said, look, there's a tendency, I think for people in recovery, especially people with short time to kind of idolize people with long-term sobriety. But the truth of the matter is, is that we're all doing this one 24 hours at a time. And if people are holding you up to an unrealistic standard and the truth shatters their vision of who you are, then maybe that vision needed to die anyway. And we rode in silence for a while. And I said, hey, you know, maybe Sunday we can get together and finish this interview. And he said, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll call you. And we got to where we were going. And I was letting him out. And he said, man, I, I don't really know how to get back. I don't know how to c climb back into sobriety from here. I don't, I don't know what to do. And I said, you just got to tell the truth, man. And anyway, he, he didn't call me this morning. So I'm not going to violate this guy's anonymity. I mean, I wouldn't dream of doing that, but you know, when I first started doing this podcast, I talked to a bunch of people about doing a podcast about depression and anxiety and musicians and addiction. And several people I talked to were like, I don't really want to sit and listen to a podcast uh, where people talk about how bad things used to be and how it's all figured out now, because I don't, I don't generally trust people who have it all figured out. And I was like, I don't really have any predetermined notion that it's only going to be people who have it figured out. 
like I was also going to talk to people who were down in it, and I was thinking this might be a really great interview for Crash and Ride for me to get with this guy and, and like let him spill about how he got to where he is and what he's feeling now that he's in the moment and that he's really having like kind of a rough time. But I never heard from him today. I'm a little disappointed, but I'm not shocked. I hope he's doing okay. I wish him all the best. I have 30 minutes of really, really good talk where we talk about the hope that somehow a record deal will validate you and fill that hole, that emptiness inside you that you've tried to fill with drugs and, and other people's bodies and buying gear and, and and just every kind of obsession that you hope to like quiet that like raging loneliness that sort of blows through you sometimes. And we talked some about anger, and we talked about disappointment, and we talked about exhaustion. It was really, really good to a little manic. It was a very animated conversation, and, you know, like, I really get caught up in people sometimes, and I, and I spent the rest of the evening just kind of feeling like I'd had, like, four espressos, and, and, and I went home and, and kind of lay there in bed thinking, what the fuck just happened? And um, anyway... Yeah, so who knows if we'll ever finish that interview. But I had to sort of scramble for the rest of the weekend and find a willing uh, participant in an interview and finally connected with my friend John, who gave me one of the best talks of Crash and Ride. So I'm really pleased about that. If this is your first Crash and Ride and you're wondering what the fuck is going on here, Crash and Ride is a long-form interview podcast where I talk to musicians who survived anxiety, depression, and addiction. I'm a recovering person and a professional drummer. And, you know, uh, I don't think there's a right way and a wrong way to stop feeling sad. Uh, I think that it's good when people do. And I wanted to create a forum where we could talk about that journey. This intro is already too long, so I'm going to jump into the announcements real quick. Crash and Ride is brought to you in part by Greer Amplification. Greer Amp spills the best boutique effects pedals available. If you're looking for an overdrive, boost, fuzz, compressor, or tremolo that is rugged, road tested, and at home, on stage, in the studio, or in your living room, Greer has a pedal for you. Nick and his staff strive to build the best products around with the best tone you've ever heard. They believe in their products, and they stand behind them too, backing each one up with a lifetime warranty to the original owner. Each Greer Amps product is hand-built in Athens, Georgia, USA. Go to www.greeramps.com or visit your favorite music retailer today. Crash and Ride is also brought to you in part by Jittery Joe's, a local coffee roaster based in Athens, Georgia. They have a special espresso blend named after the podcast. You can get Crash and Ride espresso in whole bean form or ground off the website, crashandridepodcast.com. If you click the link that says store there on the website, you can also see t-shirts in black or blue with the Crash and Ride logo and the slogan, Loud Guitar Save Lives on the front. There are men's and women's sizes up there. They're $20 plus $5 shipping. That's crashandridepodcast.com slash store. All right, today's interview, John Macbeth, a guy I've known for 15 or more years. Um, just a really, really good guy. He's played guitar in a whole bunch of great metal bands, and I've been trying to get him on the show for months. And finally, I called him today, and I was like, you know what? I got an emergency. Let's just do this today. So I went to his house. I set up my mics in his living room. And you can kind of hear the heater running while we're talking, and you can hear his enormous, another enormous pit bull, another beautiful, enormous pit bull at an interview that hung out with us the whole time. Izzy is his big blue pit bull. I'm going to put a picture of her in the show notes just so you can see how gorgeous she is. I swear I may love a big blue pit bull more than just about any other dog that isn't a bird dog. So I did something unusual with John because I suspected, and I was correct, that his ACE score may be higher than mine. ACE stands for Adverse Childhood Experience. And I've talked about ACE scores and Dr. Nadine Burke Harris on the show more than once, uh, and I talk about her in the interview. But uh, I went ahead and did the ACE test with John during the show. And I, and I thought about taking it out afterwards because it's so personal. But, you know, after we finished the interview, he was like, what is this whole ACE thing about? And I was like, well, you should watch the video that I'm going to link to in the show notes. But um, according to the CDC, as your ACE score increases, so does the risk of disease, social, and emotional problems. With an ACE score of four or more, things start getting serious. The likelihood of chronic pulmonary lung disease increases 390%. Hepatitis, 240%. Depression, 460%. Attempted suicide, 1,220%. So grab a pad and pen and take the score alongside me and John. 
Um, there's a book called The Body Keeps the Score about overcoming the physical ramifications of childhood trauma. And I should read the book. I haven't. But several people have recommended it to me, including Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, who, as I've mentioned before, I would cheerfully uh, jump on a hand grenade for. So I'm going to get that book. I'll read it. and We'll talk about it on the air. Okay, this is easily the longest intro I've ever done. I'm starting to sound like Mark fucking Marin up in here. So let's just go ahead and jump into our interview with John Macbeth. All right, I'm here with John Macbeth, guitar player, singer, songwriter, all-around metal dude, former bands Fallow, Angel Fist, now with a band called Husk. We've known each other about, what, 15 years now? At least, yeah. Yeah, I guess we met in around 2003, 2004 when I was in Music Hate You. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You were kind of a mess then. No judgment, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you could say that. 2003, 2004, I was... I was I was pretty fucking out there. Yeah. Yeah. Where'd you grow up? Um, mainly here in Athens. Yeah. Yeah. But your family's from like North Georgia, right? Yeah, Dahlonega area. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I actually was raised by my grandmother mostly and lived with her until I was about uh, 12 or 13. And then that's when I uh, moved in with my father. Yeah. Down here in Athens. Yeah, that's right. Your dad was a musician too. Yep. Yeah. What? Why? Um. What, so what? So sort of precipitated your move in with your grandma? Moving in with my grandmother? Yeah. Um. Well, I mean that's kind of a long story, but um, my parents, uh, when they got together, they were really young. Yeah. My mom was actually, I think she had, she was on some sort of a release from a juvenile detention center of sorts yeah yeah um so teenage teenage yeah she was she was 17 my dad was 21 um my mom also um was an alcoholic from a very early age and uh had kind of rebelled pretty hard you know and gotten into some trouble yeah you know and um her family is military yeah so they moved around a lot yeah she had four older sisters yeah my granddad was a uh uh lieutenant colonel oh really yeah green beret oh shit so was he at benning i don't think he was i'm not sure if he was ever at benning i know that the reason that they were in dahlonega dawsonville area um was that he was teaching at the ranger camp oh yeah the ranger school mountain phase is up there Mm -hmm. no shit that and there's a lot of family of his in that area yeah so a good deal for him Mm. so right about the time you started to kind of become a young adult you bailed out of grandma's house was was it becoming kind of a control issue for her and yeah i think some of it was like that um so because of well for a lot of reasons but um my parents split up when i was about six months old and um and my mom, uh, she, um, her family had, I guess, invested interest in trying to, um, you know, get custody of me. My my granddad um, was particularly uh, interested in having me full time. And, yeah. um, and the other side was my father, who actually did live with us until I was about five, and then his mom and his sister. So um, growing up, until I was, he lived with us, like I said, until I was about five. And then being a musician uh, himself, I guess he, and very young as well, you know, um, made a decision to move. I think he initially moved to Gainesville to be in a, a rock band. And then from there, eventually Athens. Yeah. Um, That's Gainesville, Georgia, for <laughs> listeners who aren't in Georgia. There's a Gainesville, Georgia, too. They don't have fest there. <laughs> <laughs> It's another whole Gainesville, and it's got its own thing. So, yeah, I was getting to your question. Uh, what led up to me actually kind of moving in with my father was that um, my mom continued to struggle with her substance abuse 
issues and yeah. uh, i would see her i had visitation basically my 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 dad's family ended up you know being granted custody right um you know initially when i would go and see her um you know i think there was some times my dad was concerned i was put in you know awkward situations when my mom was drinking or doing other things i also had a stepfather um who was abusive uh physically and somewhat sexually abusive and um when you know that that sort of situation became apparent um i was back in court over the custody thing you know again that that went that went on for probably the first 10 years of my life but what ended up happening is is that i spent a lot of time with my grandparents on my mom's side yeah and a lot of time with my my dad's mom you know she basically raised me to that point but once i got into puberty i was just a little too much for her to deal with yeah you know yeah so the stepdad when did he come into your life i think i was about five did he ever face any repercussions for the things he did no i mean and it's really hard for me to recall i share this when um whenever i'm asked to tell my story because i think it's important for people to i mean for me it was important when i first heard you know a man in recovery talk about you know childhood abuse because uh, i think on a lot of levels um we're almost socialized to suppress hell yeah we are you know those those memories all the shame that comes with it um, yeah you know and that sort of thing for me uh i don't know how extensive it was i sort of have like a flashbulb memory of some of the abuse but i mainly remember the physical abuse you know yeah um so he yeah he was abusive to my mother and then also you know he was an alcoholic and a drug addict and i think he probably sold drugs and that was kind of his his thing but yeah um he's dead now yeah <laughs> so we don't know if he's faced any repercussions for his actions right well I, yeah just to clarify yeah. i didn't do anything right, but, right right you know yeah but i wanted to sure yeah. sure sure man you done any work on that yeah, I've done, I've been in, uh, well, obviously, some spiritual work through um, recovery, but also um, I've sought out therapy. I've yeah. been in and out of therapy my, you know, most of my life. Yeah. Yeah. So your early life is sort of characterized by this tremendous instability, the times when you're with your stepfather and your mom. It's not just unstable, it's dangerous. Mm -hmm. And... Um, you know, I just had Doug Grion on the show last week, and he was talking about how when he sits in an AA meeting, he looks around and listens to people share and gets to know people in the fellowship, and he thinks so many people are there because they're self-medicating a mood disorder, like they have chronic depression or chronic anxiety, and they're they're using drugs and alcohol as a way of of, of trying to master that. and. And I think that there's something to that. It's been sort of rolling around in my head like a marble in a shoebox ever since he said it. Because it seems to me like so many of us first get to drugs and we're like, oh, God, mm. I'm finally not anxious. You know? Oh, yeah. I mean, for me, it's more um, I definitely have suffered at times um, from depression and anxiety yeah um obviously because of my um addiction issues um most of the standard treatments don't necessarily work for me yeah you know i'm highly allergic right right um i break out track marks and handcuffs right broken noses <laughs> and dumpsters yeah me too yeah. Um, um but yeah then everyone's always like well you should take xanax it's like no mm. not me man Let's, not anymore yeah yeah <laughs> but when did you first run up on drugs how old were you? Um, my first experience, I mean, I had had, you know, kind of that childhood experience that I hear a lot of people talk about where, you know, the you get past some, some wine or something at a social situation, but a um, family gathering or whatnot. And I had experienced that. But the first time that I had um, access to as much alcohol as I could drink, I was probably, I think I was like 13 about to be 14 maybe i had just turned 14 right um i had moved here to athens but i had yet to i think i had i may have gone through the last year of middle school yeah and um you know had tried to connect 
on some level with people. But I do want to say one thing is that, you know, a lot of times when you hear people tell their stories, they talk about wanting to belong, you know, and I think because of, for whatever reason, maybe it was because of the childhood trauma or just my personality. I didn't, I didn't want to belong. Yeah. Like I just wanted to be as far away from, from you as I could be. Right. Right. You know, and I couldn't stand, um, my own skin. So people made you anxious. Yeah. That's a good way to put it. Um, you know, I mean, growing up and experiencing abuse, I think that, I think that on some level you learn really, um, early on that, um, the people that are closest to you are the ones that hurt you the most. Yeah. Or on some level, some of them had for me. So, um, I just didn't trust people and I definitely did not, um, have anything for developing a relationship with another man. Right. You know, because if he could overpower you, he could hurt you badly. Yeah. I mean, I guess that's part of it. I don't know that I put that much thought into it then. Um, you know, for me, the alcohol, the first time that I drank was a solution for all that shit. Yeah. You know, it was, uh, sort of like a magical (laughs) elixir. Right. Um, the first time that I drank, I went to a, um, I guess it was a little, uh, high school party or, or pre high school party where somebody's parents were out of town. Yeah. Yeah. You know, kind of a thing. And, um, it's a weird mix of people. It's kind of like the stoner kids and like the, the preppy kids were all at the same party, but, yeah. um, the common denominator was like a shit ton of alcohol. Yeah. And so, um, I just went straight for the first bottle that I saw, which happened to be probably, it was probably McCormick's. I remember it was vodka, but it was probably really nasty vodka. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and drank as much as I could and then followed that up with straight or did you put oh, it on? straight? Yeah. 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 There was a, um, I kind of have like a memory of there being another, there was a girl that I had a little crush on that was there and she was drinking straight vodka. So, oh boy. Yeah. So we had a little chug off contest and then i chased that down with some some form of whiskey and then top that off with tequila you know yeah i remember all this because i only so i had an experience right so once i reached that place when the alcohol had entered my body and it was so much that immediately i started to feel that warm fuzzy you know yeah um it was the first time in my existence that i could you know, that I could ever remember feeling, um, somewhat free. Yeah. You know, and that I could, uh, some of that anxiety that you talked about or the social anxiety, Yeah, you know, especially in puberty, um, just kind of like melted away, you know, and, um, I could be whoever I needed to be. I could say whatever I needed to say. I could be the life of the party, you know? And I was for probably about, an hour maybe an hour and a half (laughs) and then the descent into alcohol poisoning yeah you know and so the first time i drank i got sick you know i mean violently ill the guy that i was uh the buddy of mine that i was uh hanging out with that night his mom happened to be a registered nurse so when she discovered my situation she promptly administered you know alka-seltzer i think or something to make me vomit and then you know, his punishment was he had to sit up with me all night, <laughs> make sure that I didn't <laughs> choke on my vomit. Um, but, you know, the thing that I think makes us, you know, that's not an uncommon experience, I think, for a lot of, you know, you know, teens or whatever. But um, I think the thing that makes me a little different from my fellows is that after that horrendous experience, the very next day, even though I felt like shit, the um, first thing on my mind was when can I do that again? Yeah. You know? Yeah. And that's pretty much how it went for me. Um, throughout the two, two following years of high school. Um, you know, I just kind of went from drug to drug to drug looking for something that I liked alcohol, but for me it was, um, it was uncontrollable. You know, when I drink, it's, you know, it's off to the races. Like I don't, yeah. You know, I drink till I pass out or, do something stupid or, yeah yeah you know get sick yeah highly allergic yeah yeah but drugs came right on the heels of the alcohol well man i figured i could control drugs a little better you know um i started obviously with like the usual 
suspects the marijuana was a um was a staple um and then i started getting into hallucinogens pretty heavily for you know those early years um lots of lsd and um when we couldn't find that i mean i didn't have a problem with drinking a couple bottles of robitussin right to get where you know there was a big downtown culture of robitussin here in athens for a long time oh yeah yeah we, I would hear them referred to as the robo punks or the robo heads. Yep. And there was probably four or five kids who were just notorious. Yep. And were often hanging out. What was that new? Uh, What's that new stand right downtown? Barnett's. Barnett's. They were always in front of Barnett's. Yeah, Barnett's. And then back then there was also a place that the kids could go and drink. Um, down towards the uh, what is now the Classic Center area, but they're um on I guess it's broad east broad uh pepinos and sneakers yeah yeah the two little there's a pizza joint and then there was an italian restaurant that opened up next to it but they were basically the same same sort of deal yeah if you had somebody with an id they weren't if they felt like they had to harass you or kick you out they would but for the most part they knew those kids were drinking yeah, yeah. there's a little arcade in the back of pepinos that yeah when it first opened i remember it was a much bigger room and and then in the back there was like an area where they couldn't see you from the counter. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep, the good old days. When did you start playing music? Um, for me, I um, I started playing obviously like in in band in in probably elementary school or, or middle school, and that was traditional orchestra. What instrument? Um, actually, I started on the saxophone. Um, but in that first year, I think I went to the, um, I went to a baritone sax and then to something else. And then you don't still play Barry, do you? No. God, that's a, that's an instrument. If you play baritone sax, you will always work. <laughs> like there's always work for a baritone sax player in a bigger town. Yeah, man. Woodwind instruments weren't, weren't, weren't my thing. I, I pretty quickly, I just went to, um, the drum kit, you know, I didn't know you played drums. Yeah little bit i mean yeah i don't know if you'd say played i used to beat the shit out of them me too yeah <laughs> kind of still do that yeah you do <laughs> you're a monster well that uh, oh come on you know it i enjoy it a lot yeah uh, there's some guys that i watch all the time and i'm like i'm never gonna be that good oh uh-huh. you know brian blade i don't he's a guy from he it's like Brian, brian blade has a sex dad and it's like watching like love supreme era john coltrane shit and it just I watch it and I just it blows my fucking mind every time. Yeah, it's so good. Yeah, I'll have to check it out. So, so you were kind of roughly feral like during those Pepino's years. Like I remember that that crew kind of was always downtown mm-hmm. and always the square cool. rats. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, you were one of those kids, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. A little on the younger side of that crowd, but yeah. So I caught all the shit basically. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, which is good. I mean, it helped toughen me up a little bit. Were you still pl- were you playing music at that point? Um, yeah, I was. So, like I said, I had started on drums, and I think that um, that was my first instrument. And then by the time that I had moved here to live with my father, I had sort of graduated to bass. Yeah. That was my first string instrument. Um, and then pretty quickly, you know, it's funny because. Um, I think you mentioned earlier my dad was a musician as well and they would have a lot of practices at the house so I was exposed to it you know all the time yeah 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 and um you know was just I I guess at that point I was just sort of still learning and basically taught myself you know the more popular songs of the day you know the whole on the bass yeah yeah bass and then I would pick up my dad's guitar and try to learn you know whatever grunge song was popular at the time you know (laughs) yeah were there any bands during that time for you for me yeah did you play any bands no i i actually um in the in the following years um i mean i jammed with a lot of people but i was never in any kind of solid project i think the the um most most cohesive thing i did was because my dad was in a band he had a a bit of recording equipment so i started recording my own songs and i just played everything yeah you know do those types still exist 
Yeah, I'm sure he has them somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Be interesting to hear them. You know, now um, they probably sound a lot like early Tool and uh, yeah. Alice in Chains. Because that's what you were listening to. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Did you ever have you ever reconciled with your mom? You guys squared up or? Yeah. Um. You know, unfortunately, she passed. Um. In January of 2015. Um. She, you know, as a direct result, I would assume of her of her you know alcoholism um she never got sober she did for periods of time um i don't know the full details you know as far as when i was younger but um i mean she and i you know had by the time i was a teenager um we you know there were there were times where we drank together you know and um i think that from her standpoint um and maybe it was justification but i think she felt like I was going to do it anyway and she would prefer I'd do it at home. Sure. You know? Yeah. Um, and, and there was, our relationship was a little, I think different than the traditional, what I would perceive to be a traditional mother son relationship. She, we were more like really, really, really good friends. And she was also, you know, definitely my mom on a lot of levels and taught me a lot of things. And, you know, a lot of the things that she taught me are still, very much with me today yeah you know but there was also that dynamic of um you know the other things we had in common you know yeah the disease of addiction and and we partied together um on a small level throughout my teenage years and then i think that she i mean honestly i think she grew to regret a lot of that because you know i went off the deep end pretty hard when i was 16 but um you know uh when I did eventually get sober in, in 2006, um, she, I think she had some consequences, probably some legal consequences, but she started, you know, seeking out treatment and she did have some considerable, uh, clean time, but inevitably I think she would, um, you know, not to tell her story or anything, but inevitably she would end up taking a drink again and that would lead towards some of the other stuff. Her thing wasn't, street drugs like mine i think it was mainly alcohol and pharmaceuticals have you done any work on the codependency stuff codependency um i mean (laughs) are you asking if i've been in any codependent relationships no (laughs) (laughs) you know codependency is funny to me because um i did actually and this kind of ties in nicely because at one point in sobriety i reached a place where i was um you know fairly on some level suicidal yeah you know probably the closest i ever came towards or have come towards wanting to actually take a drink and sobriety was behind um you know uh or really to 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 put it bluntly trying to control another person yeah you know in a, in a relationship yeah um and wasn't going so well no and um i had basically on some level i think made that person a bit of a higher power in my life so um for me what was suggested um was that i uh look into a 12-step program for you know people that um struggle with that you know and um so i did go to al-anon yeah for a while and man um I have to say that, it, you know, it's funny because at the end of the day, if you're an alcoholic or a drug addict and you haven't taken a drink, then, you know, it could be argued that it's a successful day. Yeah. You know, but if you're severely codependent, you know, at the end of the day, it's such a gray area. It's like, you know, well, am I sober today? Right. What do you think, Patrick? <laughs> tell me how i should feel about myself right well you've heard the joke right did you hear about the codependent that fell out of a window yeah <laughs> someone else's life flashed before his eyes yeah they have a good they have a good Allen on joke about alcoholics too it's pretty harsh it says uh what's the difference between the uh, a dog and an alcoholic uh, i don't know it's the dog quits whining when you let it back in the house <laughs> <laughs> that's good oh jesus yeah but there's a i mean for me there's just a whole another level of work 
when yeah. it comes to that thing. And and for me, it's like not that you could really classify it, but it's almost like if AA was, um, you know, college and then 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 Al Anon for me would be like grad school. Yeah. Well, you know, for me, working on the codependency stuff really gets at the shit that's hard for me. Like I can sit in an AA meeting or NA meeting or CA meeting or whatever and think I'm a piece of shit who can't use drugs. Hmm. And all I have to do is stay sober. But when I when I get into the, the Al-Anon rooms and start working on my codependency shit, it's like I've got to defuse this bomb that puts me in this spiral, this emotional spiral, this mm-hmm. depression that follows my inability to um, allow people to live their lives. Mm-hmm. And um, that's tough. You know, that's a lot harder for me. It is. Um, it's, 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 it's all gray. You know what I mean? It's the yeah. type of thinking around that side of, of this disease, because I, I do feel like, um, well, at least, I sh- you know, in my experience, being the adult child of an alcoholic, there's just patterns of behavior and ways of thinking that were established in me at such a young age that I, I wouldn't say on a level um, that it contributed to my alcoholism. Yeah. I mean, it's very likely that it did, but alcohol was um, the solution for that on some level, but it was also a solution for some other things, you know? Yeah. Well, you've probably got some PTSD from all the violence. Well, and, and, you know, not to make a huge deal out of it because I know that, um, or, or make it small at all. I mean, I I think that there are people that, um, definitely experience, um, you know, childhood trauma on a much deeper level. Um, you know, for me, um, I think any amount at all definitely, does has a potential to scar someone um but you know a lot of the things that i carried i think into the into sobriety that took a while to sort of realize that i was going to have to deal with yeah um a lot of that stuff also happened in the course of of drinking you know because um you know once i once i found my drug of choice or whatever you want to call it for me it was iv heroin yeah um, I was 16 and had experimented with everything I could get my hands on. Sure. I had also told myself it was something I was never going to do, you know. Well, y'all say that. Yeah, exactly. Well, I, ne- I mean. I'm, I'm never going to snort it. Right. I'm never going to smoke it. <laughs> I'm never going to, you know, run it. Well, I, well, except for that last one, I would have said the other two were a waste, you know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> if, it can get, if it can get here in seven seconds, run it, you know. But, yeah. um, you know, and and. I mean, I think for me, it was, you know, the time period too. I mean, it was such a, I mean, there, I remember this video on MTV. It was like a commercial, but it was, it was probably one of those partnership for drug free America things that, um, trying to combat the whole heroin chic thing that was going down. Yeah. And it was like this guy laying on a nasty, you know, probably dope house bathroom floor, vomiting in a toilet, you know, with, you know, no shirt on just in filth, you know, and then like in large sparkly 70s balloon letters that says heroin so glamorous you know <laughs> and i mean so there was it was like it was so prevalent like this idea sure you know the uh especially being a musician right and being young in the 90s i mean it was like the the people that i were lis- was listening to um were all strung out notorious junkies yeah. you know so um i think for a while i saw the error in that from my perspective and and you know, told myself I would never go that way, but man, the first chance I got to try it, I was on it. Yeah. And it was like, I had found what I was looking for. Well, I think, and I had this conversation with someone the night before last, and I've talked about this in the intro of this episode that I was going to do an interview with a guy and midway through our conversation, I realized that he was in the middle of a relapse. Um, and, and, and that was kind of intense. And then we didn't end up finishing the conversation, but I've already, everybody who's listening to this knows that already. But um, we talked about all the things we tried to throw in that hole in ourselves to quiet that sadness, fear, anxiety, pain, and that ultimately everything fails at some point mm-hmm. other than doing the work. 
and and so you know you get to a point where you're all like i'm i, I like pain meds but i'm not going to grind them up and snort them and then you're like well i'm not gonna i'm not gonna smoke heroin and then you know it's like everything eventually lets you down mm. and you go for the next thing to see if it works any better and i i think that that is how you end up like huh, i'm gonna so I guess we're on this ride now yeah i mean it, it's um Unfortunately, a lot of people never get off of that ride until they're dead. Yeah. You know, and... Um, well, especially now, so much fentanyl just, like, out there. Yeah, I mean, and I'm, 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 in a way, I'm grateful that I went through what I went through at the time that I did because I don't know that, that I would be alive if I were doing that stuff now. Yeah. I mean, you know, I've had um, people that I've tried to work with that have, um, you know, gone out, just relapsed had a couple of beers ended up drinking and then called up the dope man and then next thing you know they're finding them room temperature yeah yeah and well um, and everybody says well you if you go to the and this is true you can go to the harm mediation clinic here and get fentanyl test strips but i'm trying to imagine being dope sick and testing your stash and finding out it's got fentanyl in it and then what i mean i mean and then what is 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 you do you you try to regulate it right and if you make it through i mean i don't know because narcan shots like that wasn't a thing when, i mean it was a thing like but you had to go to the hospital and get it it wasn't yeah. a home, at home kit yeah um you know i mean the thing i think now is that and has always really been there so i mean this whole this whole concept of an opiate um you know epidemic to me is is there is definitely a, a, some some level of of relevancy to it but you know to tell you the truth there's always been an opiate epidemic it's just got more attention now because it's affecting uh, because of the fentanyl you right. know so many people are dying people are dying yeah. and a lot of those people are young white rich kids yeah you know um yeah. which is i mean it's always been an epidemic in my opinion in some of the uh poor communities well i mean you if know? you look at the underlying racism of the war on drugs from the 1920s forward it's 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 always been there in plain sight. It never mm. becomes an issue until white kids are dying, and then it becomes an issue. You know, yeah. but I mean, it's an issue. I'm, I won't argue that it's not. I just <laughs> feel like we, we made a we we may have been better served if we'd really started to address it as an epidemic forty years ago. You know, you can also thank the pharmaceutical companies for what they did with that lovely drug oxycotton. Yeah, you know, yeah, and, and um, some of those people are going to jail. So. Yeah, well, they deserve it. Not I mean, sad about that. No. Um, Tell me something. Have you ever? Do you know? Do you know your ACE score? I'm not sure what that means. Adverse I think I'm all aces. But ad adver <laughs> adverse childhood experience. No, I've never, I've never heard of it. Adverse childhood experiences. There's a there's a woman. Um, she's a doctor. She's the Surgeon General of, of um, the state of California, and um, her name is. Uh, Nadine Burke Harris and she I would jump on a hand grenade for her without question um, she's really 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 amazing um, about addressing trauma through your your childhood traumas and how they affect health and, and mental health outcomes later in life and she's a clinician she's got a clinic in uh, Oakland in California and she's just absolutely brilliant but let's we're going to do this for the first time it's going to take me a second to pull it up, but we're going to do your ACE score. All righty. Prior to your 18th birthday, did a parent or other adult in the household often or very often swear at you, insult you, put you down, or humiliate you, or act in a way that made you afraid you might be physically hurt? Yes. Question two. Did a parent or other adult in the household often or very often push, grab, slap, or throw something at you or ever hit you so hard you had marks or were injured? Um possibly i don't what what's considered often uh i don't know that's an interesting question yeah i would say more than more than once a month would be i mean it, 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 there was a period of time where that did occur so yes number three did an adult or person at least five years older than you ever touch you or final you or have you touched their body in a sexual way or attempt to actually have orals anal or vaginal intercourse with you none of the intercourse that i can recall but i'm sure there was probably some level of of you know inappropriate touching touching yeah 
Question four. Did you often or very often feel that no one in your family loved you or thought you were important or special? I remember feeling alone, so I would say that on some level, I knew people loved me, but um, I'm not sure that I really... The second half of that question is, or your family didn't look out for each other, feel close to each other, or support each other. No, I don't think that was the case. I just felt like people didn't really know what was going on. Number five, did you often or very often feel that you didn't have enough to eat or had to wear dirty clothes or had no one to protect you or your parents were too drunk or high to take care of you or take you to the doctor if you needed it? See, there again, it's like I was living in a duality where um, I was definitely getting the care I needed with my dad's family, but with my mother, it, it was random. You know, there were definitely times where I was not being taken care of. This is at any point before you were 18, so. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Were your parents ever separated or divorced? Yes. Was your mother or stepmother often or very often pushed, grabbed, slapped, or had something thrown at her, or sometimes often or very often kicked, bit, and hit with a fist or hit with something hard, or ever repeatedly hit at least a few minutes or threatened with a gun or knife? Yes. Did you live with someone who was a problem drinker or alcoholic or who used street drugs? Yes. Nine, was a household member depressed or mentally ill, or did a household member attempt suicide? Uh, yes, in the first part. Number 10, did a household member ever go to prison? Prison or jail? Um, it just says prison, but I think jail also would count. Well, I just, I would say prison, no, jail, yes. So, Well, you have uh, the highest A score of anyone I've ever talked to. Um. Do I win anything? A shorter life expectancy. <laughs> <over> 15%. <laughs> uh, just an opportunity to prove them wrong. Yeah. yeah. My, mine is, um, my A score is like seven or eight. I can't remember. But it, um, I, I'm going to, I'll put a link to the TED Talk Dr. Nadine Burke Harris does uh, in the show description because she's, uh, she's amazing. But yeah, yeah A score is is indicative of um a higher propensity towards drug or alcohol abuse or depression or anxiety or mm-hmm. and also other health outcomes and if you watch the link in the show notes you'll you'll see but i had the suspicion that yours was going to be as high or higher than mine so when did you so you stumbled up on heroin at 16 yeah that was your first time using opiates or did you do pain meds before that or something or i don't recall ever feeling that way so i imagine that was my first experience with opiates did you go iv first time oh yeah i was uh it's funny because the uh one of the uh well the people that i was getting high with none of them wanted to um you know uh, work it up for me or 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 inject me my first time yeah you know but they were trying to get me to snort it and i was like no if I'm going to do this, then I'm going to do it, you know. You were 16. Yeah. And um, I was in a little apartment in uh, off of Argonne Avenue in Atlanta mm-hmm. near the uh, Krispy Kreme on Ponds. I, I know the very one. Yeah. And um, That neighborhood's all bougie now, by the way. Oh, super. Yeah. <laughs> I, was sitting, I was sitting at a coffee shop there. I can't remember what it's called now. It's super fancy. There's a fountain. I was sitting in the courtyard of a coffee shop with a fountain, and I oriented myself. I'd been there about five minutes, and we come from a new direction for me there, and I don't live there anymore. I hadn't lived there in years, and I was like, wait a minute. That's the corner. And I turned to the person with me who was like, I love this coffee shop. It's called like Dancing Goats or something. Mm. He said, "Um, I said, past that corner, it used to be that you could get anything Mm -hmm. what do you need handgun with the numbers filed off heroin crank stolen car human baby chainsaw like past that corner it was all there for the right price Mm -hmm. and and he said now there's like condos that cost four hundred thousand dollars yeah it's like fuck yeah man so you're you're in this grimy apartment yeah i mean it wasn't terrible i mean you know and um you know the people that i was hanging out with at that period in time were older you know probably a good four or five years older than me if that if not more but um you know all musicians on some level and um you know my 
my closest friend in that situation was was who introduced me to them and and um you know we drove down there and and i remember pulling up and seeing this guy you know walking down the sidewalk and he had these long dreads probably halfway down his back and was wearing um you know like skater shorts and like a long sleeve sweater and <laughs> in june you know and yeah. uh yeah and it was just uh it was like a surreal experience and it was i don't know if it was like a feeling of of arriving but it was a feeling of um i have found something um that i've been looking for and then and then you know my first experience in um actually um uh, buying those drugs was you know that occurred that day was uh was kind of funny um you know this guy he took me down into what is known as you know some people know it as the bluff but it's oh the yeah north, the bluff yeah, yeah. north side drive yeah know, north avenue sunset meldrum those streets over there jp brawley um it's funny because this was my first white boy in the ghetto experience yeah you know and uh and here i was you know 16 and um had this um like Mazda RX-7 and you know had to take him down there to get whatever we were going to do and you know he had me park on the street corner and there's several purveyors of fine fine goods right sure <laughs> yeah yeah you know out there on the street and um you know he he left me for a good 10 or 10 or 15 minutes while he went and handled the transaction but they kept trying to approach me and I kept like starting up the car and driving like 10 feet and then <laughs> they'd walk up further and then i just because like i was committed you know what i mean like yeah yeah i was scared to death because i'd never been in that situation before yeah yeah but i was like i came for what i came for right I, i'm not gonna leave and i didn't know if these people were gonna try to rob me or what you know yeah all they were trying to do was sell me sell me drugs sure you know yeah um but yeah so anyhow after that i mean it was almost like i felt like i was in some sort of like uh, like jane's addiction movie or something you know yeah i mean i think just, that's the risk right that yeah. we take talking about it at all yeah um with people who aren't really sober is that there's a part of them that still romanticizes it and so now you're in it you're like well i'm fucking in it now yeah you know it's very dark and shiny yeah you know and i think on some level it um it, there's a lie behind it that um very quickly gets revealed for me it took I would say it took about a year and a half to two years where I just kind of dabbled. And the main reason was I did not have my own source. Yeah. But once I acquired my own source for, um, you know, um, heroin and, you know, I had also tried the IV cocaine that wasn't, wasn't as appealing to me, you know? I did not like mixing the two at once. I preferred to stagger them throughout my evening. You know. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> Get on the roller coaster. Yeah. But not all at once. Well, yeah. I just I just didn't want to take away from the heroin. Yeah. You know. But yeah, it's funny because like I just that idea of the Jane's Addiction movie. It's funny because like all all my friends at that time really loved that band. And um and I hated it. Uh, I there's something about it. I just didn't get it, but but after I did heroin that first time, <laughs> I understood it. <laughs> I was sold. Yeah. You know, um, but yeah, I mean, you know, so there was a certain amount of romancing, you know, that came along with that. And sure. And I was kind of, I mean, it's, I'm. It took about a year and a half. Year and a half for me to, to share my new right. toy with, you know, my closest friends, quote unquote. Yeah. Um and and to realize that I could basically um get high for free as long as I was the middleman for You're the plug. Yeah, cuz back yeah. then there really wasn't a, a ready uh there wasn't much of a source of that here in Athens. Yeah. You know, I mean it was if if you could find it it was either stomped on or or um overpriced or you just had to have a real good in with someone yeah someone was going for you and charging the shit out of you to do it and yeah so i figured why not um be that guy so um but once i got to that point um you know it's funny because one of uh the, the actually the guy that took me down for the first time um ended up becoming my roommate i ran into him in little five and he was uh he was homeless at the time and i was like man come stay with me and uh 
and he came and crashed with uh we had a band house so at that point i had um i still had all my gear that i had acquired you know and uh was playing uh playing some you know heavy rock heavy metal with my roommates and we all kind of sort of moved from house to house and did the band thing but we never it's funny because we only played like a hemp maybe one or two house parties yeah in any given situation so it wasn't much of a band it was basically we'd all just get wasted and make noise yeah um we ended up living on barber street um next to i think juice fur at the time yeah yeah and it was that was fun um yeah didn't really didn't really uh it's been a spent a whole lot of time communicating with the neighbors but right <laughs> um so you're at the top of this roller coaster with all your equipment oh man and then well what happened was uh like my my friend um you know was he saw me um you know moving out of just the chipping phase yeah and and i was getting high every day so i had no idea that what was in the mail for me yeah you know i mean i know this concept you're gonna get sick or whatever and that's what he'd say man you need to slow down right you know and he was going to the methadone clinic here at the time and um it's wild that we had a methadone clinic here before we had a regular heroin dealer yeah well i mean i think a lot of that is because of pharmaceuticals and there were a lot of people here that were doing heroin they were just driving to atlanta to get it yeah you know so um although i will say that the majority of the people that i met at the clinic when i eventually went to the clinic which wasn't too long after all that um most of those were like working class you know the average person i would say was like your you know your blue collar sort of um gentleman or or lady and um that had maybe had some sort of accident right and gotten pain meds yeah yeah and then it just became a thing yeah and where they were spending probably god knows how much money a day on on under the counter lower tabs yeah you know so um but yeah so you know i just i do remember the first time that i got sick and i had probably been you know getting you know getting um high for a while and uh, for whatever reason, couldn't catch my ride or couldn't meet up with my guy or whatever over a weekend. And it was like, Oh, this is, this is real. This is like a thing. Yeah. You know? And, uh, and so I tried to back off for a while, but that didn't last too long. Yeah. Within the next couple of years, I had pretty much, um, sort of, uh, I've, I'd gone through every thing that I had. Yeah. You know, I crossed that line where, you know, it's like, I was, you know, I was, uh, it, what's that saying? A monkey can't sell bananas, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, I was, I was my own best customer. Yeah. 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 And, um, the, uh, the young woman that I was in a relationship with at the time and I bounced around quite a bit. And then eventually we, we ended up, uh, you know, migrating to Atlanta. Yeah. We started basically living out of hotel rooms doing whatever we had to do to stay well yeah you know and um you know that that's when the shit for me really hit the fan as far as um that junky life was i wouldn't call it much of a life but that existence what Uh, years are we talking about i would say about 99 yeah yeah i mean there was there was a 2000 99 2000 somewhere in there yeah the christmas of 2000 2001 i was full blown you know homeless heroin addict living on the streets and you know i started having the uh legal consequences yeah you know you're exposed out there yeah um i mean there's there's some fucking crazy stories from that period of time for me um a lot of it i don't remember yeah you know um you know uh, everything from You know, getting, uh, well, uh, the things that you do every day to try to survive and just break even and keep from being sick while you're living on the streets. I mean, you you get to a place where you're pretty willing to do whatever you got to do. Yeah. Um, For me, a lot of it was like shoplifting, uh, panhandling. Yeah. um, 
you know uh at some point you get into some heavier stuff all the girls that that i was hanging out with at the time were you know um you know doing what they, whatever they had to do sure you know um so it it gets dark quick and then eventually what happens is the things that you have to do to stay um high are the things that you're trying to get high to forget yeah you know and and then at some level you're you you get to, for me i got to a place to where i mean towards the end where i just couldn't i couldn't get high enough you know it's not that i was doing too much there just wasn't enough yeah you know it wasn't working anymore yeah but yeah i mean um that's what we we're just talking about eventually everything lets you down yeah i mean uh you know i've woken up in in fulton county jail yeah um at one point i got caught up like in a very bizarre way i got caught in some sort of a prostitution sting that became a drug sting once you know i got involved you yeah know, i en encountered a lady that a young woman that i thought was you know like me turns out she was working for the police Ooh. yeah and so all i wanted to do was get high yeah you know and um anyway i ended up getting arrested yeah you know and um got my first couple of felonies during that time yeah yeah i got into a fight with the cab county hmm and never a good idea no no there's always more of those guys yeah yeah um yeah more and yeah but yeah that was in a hotel room i'd had an argument with my girlfriend at the time and um she said she was gonna leave go see the uh our guy and you know i said well that's my car and then somebody either her or the neighbor called the police the police came and told me i had to leave leave my vehicle with her and uh she started arguing with me while the cops were there and then they when i responded they got in my face and i just decided that it'd be a good idea to hit one of them in the mouth mm. yeah and then another one you know another cop uh tackled me and i uh, assaulted him as well and then the three of them together proceeded to beat the ever living shit out of me yeah you know and um no body cameras in 99 no I mean and to be quite honest I mean they were I I probably would have done the same thing there was a brief moment where everything sort of slowed down and I, I had this opportunity where I could have grabbed the officer's handgun you know and um, for whatever reason I didn't you know yeah um, thankfully and uh, you know but they uh, they had to use the use of force report take you know photographs of they basically lit me up with the uh, blackjacks yeah you know and um, and that was my first real incarceration and that you know proceeded to um, I think I ended up on I tried for first offender and the judge took one look at me and was like no and so uh, I did that thing that a lot of us do when we get in trouble in a courtroom. S say, Your Honor, please don't send me to prison. Yeah. I'm a drug addict. I need help. Please send me to rehab. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Because it's better in prison. Right. And, uh, Is that and, your uh, first brush with recovery? Uh, yeah, it's funny, though, because they did send me to a um, men's re rehabilitation program, but it was the um, Salvation Army. Oh wow! That's on Marietta Street. Yeah, and it's like two blocks from the Do bluff. The house. Yeah. 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 So within, you know, a couple of weeks of being there full time, and then immediately the day that I was able to leave site and sure. go to the store on my own, you know, yeah, I just yeah. I just got high. Yeah. And then I ended up uh, being, you know, on the uh, violating my probation and being somewhat of a, uh, you know. Uh, you know anyway but yeah yeah um so then the charges just kind of like piled up you know the the situation where i got caught into the uh the sting they ended up uh i ended up flexing a cop basically in an inadvertent way which you know means basically you uh um s sell someone fake drugs yeah you know but i wasn't the one that actually did it i just once i realized this person wasn't um you know or, or probably was a police officer i just you know bailed on them took their money and bailed 
Yeah. And then they were able to find what they thought was drugs from someone else in the neighborhood. And then uh, shortly thereafter arrested me leaving, you know, and charged me with sale of heroin and cocaine. And um, I ended up, of course, once the crime lab or whatever results came back, it wasn't actually what they thought it was. But I did have things on me when I was arrested. Yeah. So they dropped the charges from sale to just possession. And, um, you know, I was caught in that legal system where I was on probation or incarcerated in a cab being shipped to Fulton back and forth. I ended up spending about two and a half, three years incarcerated during that time period. Yeah. And um, the rest of the time I was on the streets. Yeah. You know. I met you in 2003, I think. Yeah. And you were, we were at Little Italy getting pizza. And you showed up, and I remember you were wearing a silk shirt, like a nice shirt, but, <laughs> but your skin looked like chalk. Yeah, like or it was like it's like that. Um, it's like sheetrock mud. Your your skin looked like yeah. It was that like yeah. I was dead dead man walking, pale, grainy. Mm-hmm. And at one point, you got up to go to the bathroom, and I said to the guys at the table. That guy's not doing good. I don't think he's going to make it. Yeah. Um, so that at that point in time, I had managed to get off the streets in Atlanta. Yeah. Um, I came back to Athens. I got on a methadone maintenance program here um, and did okay for a little while. Then, um, you know, for me, methadone is not medicine you know i'll just be honest uh you know it's there's a lot of i guess there's a lot of opinions out there about medically assisted recovery yeah you know me personally through my own experience um you know from what i've learned in true recovery um is that you know the, the disease that i suffer from is it's there's a spiritual solution for it yeah but the disease itself is physical and mental yeah you know and i have to have to find a treatment that works for me that covers both both ends of that yeah you know a mental obsession and a physical allergy and for me as long as i was on those maintenance programs even though i mean i'll be i'll be quite honest with you i was i was getting high on the medication yeah i probably didn't think i was but um you know i certainly wasn't who i am right now yeah you know and um as long as i am treating it with my my disease is going to get treated one way or the other yeah if i'm treating it with that for me i'm just keeping that physical allergy just going right under the surface yeah you know and my experience with the willingness and like sort of what they talk about as a bottom in recovery um you know for me i i definitely hit bottom several times you know for whatever reason this last time was sufficient it wasn't really any different from any other time um <clears throat> during that period of time you know i mean after i moved back here got on the clinic and, and was doing that thing i mean i got two duis two weeks apart you know um here in athens yeah you know i basically um just kind of shifted over was was doing everything else put it on top of that that medication or whatever and um and you know ended up the last time the second second dui in that period i i I had quite a quite a bit of things on me and when i got pulled over i ingested all of it oh god and so they arrested me took me to clark county jail and by the time i got there i wasn't breathing so then they sent me to athens regional and um that gave me the uh, narcan yeah you know rock star detox yeah yeah and um man i came to out of this like just darkness Mm -hmm. you know i don't really have a memory of it other than the the actual coming into consciousness feeling yeah with instantaneous withdrawal you know Mm. was not a pleasant sensation no i've i've not ever been narcan but i've heard it's fucking unpleasant it's like cold fire running up your spine yeah is the way I could describe it, but um, you know, and then the you know the 
the whole Tourette's aspect where you're just saying whatever the fuck is coming out of your mouth. <laughs> right. Yeah. And the police, I remember the police officer that was standing there, the officer that arrested me, like went to restrain me. And the doctor was like, no, 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 this is totally normal. You know, and um, mm -hmm. so uh, the I think that the uh, ACC PD made an executive decision. It did not want to be responsible for my medical bills. Right. So they just left. They literally gave me a ticket for DUI. <laughs> it, le <laughs> it left me in the hospital. <laughs> so I don't know if that happens too much. But um, no. so I ended up showing up to court and I thought I was on time, but I was a day and an hour late. And so they arrested me. And that was probably the worst detox I'd ever experienced in my life is coming off of methadone. Yeah. It was terrible. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I couldn't eat, sleep, or hardly stand up for maybe two and a half, three weeks, you know? Yeah. And um, this was in Clark County Jail. Yeah. And that was around that time period when you yeah. encountered me. And, and, and also at that time, because of the legal consequences I was experiencing, I had had... Um, you know, experience with treatment or, or 12 step programs before that. But at this point in time, it was, a a, a new thing they were starting here in Clark County called the drug court. Yeah. It was DUI drug court. It wasn't felony drug court yet. Right. You know, it was judge Lawrence, um, at the time. And so they thought that I would be a prime candidate for that. Um, part of the, uh, uh, part of the sentence was that I be uh, spend a minimum of like six months at the Hope House here in Athens. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's funny because they sentenced me without actually asking the um, the owner if he would would have me as a client. So yeah, that was an interesting conversation. <laughs> you know, call and collect from jail. Yeah, you know, hey, <laughs> and they're like, who, what? Yeah. You know? um, but yeah, so I mean, I don't think at that point they had experienced someone quite like me, yeah. you know, like a, a real street addict. Yeah. Most of the people they were dealing with were probably alcoholics with multiple DUIs or people that just maybe weren't even alcoholics at all had just, you know, made some bad decisions. But like, you know, they expected you to do A, B, and C, be at this place at this time and do this and that. And, yeah. You know, I mean, I, I couldn't. You know, I mean, I'd show up to their little status conference with, you know, paraphernalia on me, you know, yeah. um, and it, I mean, clean paraphernalia, but yeah, you know, and then, and then look surprised when they arrest me, you know what I mean? Like, right. you know what? I mean, <laughs> the insanity of it, but, um, yeah. yeah, they, they didn't know what to do with me. So eventually, eventually I had to max out my probation here, but, um, one thing that did occur during that time period was I made like a genuine contact with people in recovery. Yeah. You know, and there were a few people that I developed very brief, but, um, meaningful relationships with in a short period of time. And, um, so I also, it's a um, solid dudes. I know a bunch of those people. Yeah. There's some good guys around, around that situation. And, yeah. Uh, also during that period of time, I uh, found out I was going to be a father. So that had a lot of, I mean, it had a, I would say on a level it influenced me, but it wasn't enough to deter me from doing what I was doing. I mean, I, I mean, I was out of control. Yeah. Um, there was no putting a, a lid on it for me, but I, but I tried, Yeah. you know, for the first time, I think. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, so I, f I would find myself in meetings you know, intoxicated. Yeah. Sharing. Right. <laughs> Sweating. <laughs> Nodding out in mid chair. Yeah, yeah. Sure. You know, yeah, and, yeah. Then, and then come back out of a nod and start sharing where I left off. <laughs> 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 and so there's a level of love and tolerance. Yeah, sure. In those rooms that I think was shown, was definitely shown to me, you know. What were your thoughts on being a dad and being a junkie at that point? I mean, I think for me, um, it was complicated because. I was afraid of the responsibility. Yes. Even though I probably couldn't admit that. Yeah. Um, but also um, was afraid of the consequences of if I did not accept that responsibility. You yeah. know, um, if I continued to do what I was doing, maybe, I mean, I'm sure the thought crossed my mind just to leave. Sure. You know, and, and go somewhere else because 
um, just get a f as far away from my son as possible. So I did not have a negative impact on his life. Based on your own experience. Hey, it's a good point, but yeah, yeah possibly. Yeah. I mean, what having not been shown otherwise. Yeah. Um, so, um, I think that there was a thought that I did have pretty regularly that is if I continue to do this and it kills me, you know, this commitment I have to this thing, which is like, I'll die for it. You know, I mean, that's kind of how that whole Ivy drug use game is. I mean, you, anytime, right. This is the one, you know? Yeah. Um, so I think that on some level I felt that if that did occur, that at some point my, there's a possibility that my son would want to know what was so, what was so important or good about this, that my father was willing to choose this over me, you know? And yeah. That was a thought that complicated things for me, you know? I don't think, you know, they talk about you got to do this thing for you when you get sober. Yeah. I'll tell you, man, I was incapable of doing it for me. Yeah. I didn't give a shit about me, you know? Yeah. Um, for me, uh, when I was finally willing and I tried that was like the beginning of trying to do something different. And one of the things that I tried was getting out of Athens. I went to a co-ed halfway house in Brunswick, Georgia. Mm -hmm. That was an interesting experience. <laughs> yeah. You know, but, um, I had, a. I did make contact with the steps. Yeah. You know, and, um, and for me, uh, it was, I, I think I stayed sober for about five months before I, um, before I relapsed. I don't even know if you would consider it a relapse because I don't know that I had a lot of recovery. I think I was abstaining. <laughs> right. You know? Yeah. Um, I was avoiding the God question. Sure. Lots of people use the God question as an excuse not to get sober. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's excuse not to get sober, an excuse not to live a good life. Yeah. Not to take responsibility or accountability for anything I've ever done. The most valuable thing anybody ever said to me about that was, you don't have to believe in the same God I do or who that guy does or the preacher in the church you grew up in when you were a kid. You just have to know that there's a higher power and it ain't you. Right. And that was enough for me. Once I finally had that answer, I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I got that one too. I mean, I think that, that, that I don't know of any other place on earth that you can go and talk about God or what God, this concept of God is for each individual yeah. about what that God is doing for them in their lives. Mm -hmm. And nobody in that situation can tell anyone else who or what that God looks like. Yeah. You know, try to find that somewhere else. Yeah. You know, on um, a deep, meaningful level. I think that the greatest thing about, and I don't want to sidetrack this conversation too much because it's been really good, but the, to me, Alcoholics Anonymous is the world's largest anarchist organization. There's no dues or fees. We have no leaders. It's a completely flat organization. We don't even know half the people in there's last names. And yet, it fucking works. People are like, I don't know, man. This whole like leaderless society thing's never going to work. And I'm like, motherfucker, I've seen it. It saved my life. <laughs> well, it's true democracy. Right. Yeah. And it doesn't do anything more important than saving thousands of lives every year. Mm. But... I mean, what else do you need an organization to do? Yeah, and I mean, on a certain level, I feel like I'm toasting my anonymity here, and I want to be respectful of that. But I will say this, that if it wasn't for the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, I wouldn't be here. Yeah. You know, I mean, it has done so much more for me um, than just save a life. Yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. It, um, you're more than not dead now. Yeah. It's a life worth living. It's right. a life of purpose and meaning. Hey, Crash and Ride would like to let you know about a new industry-wide initiative focused on mental health called Backline. Backline is a hub for artists, industry professionals, and their families to quickly and easily access mental health and wellness resources. Backline is partnered with leading support organizations and care providers to streamline access to services specifically geared towards the music industry. Go to www.backline.care to get the support that you need to thrive both on and off the road. 
The way that Backline works is you contact them via their website or their 800 number and they will connect you with a caseworker. That caseworker will be familiar with resources in your area to get you the mental health care that you need. If you need to talk to a therapist, they can put you in touch with a therapist. If you need to talk to a psychiatrist and be evaluated for meds, they have a list of psychiatrists. They have resources for inpatient therapy. They can put you in touch with sober companions. If you need someone to travel with you while you're on the road and help you stay out of trouble, Backline is a really end-to-end comprehensive solution for people who are struggling in the music industry. Now, a little closer to home, if you're in the Athens, Georgia area and you're a musician struggling with anxiety and depression, you can contact NucciSpace at 706-227-1515 or go to NUCI.org. That's Nucci.org. NucciSpace is a nonprofit musician's resource focused on suicide prevention. Here's how Nucci's works. If you contact them and you say, hey, look, I'm in crisis, whether you're a musician or not, they'll connect you with resources in the Athens, Georgia area. If you're a musician, that health care will be subsidized. In my own case, I was able to see a counselor for 15 or 20 bucks a session. If you're not a musician, they'll do their best to connect you with low cost or sliding scale options for mental health care in Athens. Nuju Space provides a lot of resources for musicians in the Athens area. They have low cost practice spaces, they have a gear cell where they're constantly selling second hand gear, they've got a low cost recording studio. They're really just an amazing asset to the Athens, Georgia music scene, but their primary mission is helping people who are depressed or anxious get better. Go to NUCI.org, that's Nucci.org, or call 706-227-1515. And finally, no matter where you are, if you're struggling with anxiety and depression and you're contemplating self-harm, you can always call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at one 1- 800-273-8255. That's 1-800-273-TALK. It's 24-7. It's free. It's confidential. They have trained volunteers to help get you through your crisis and get you the help that you need. Call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-8255 or go to suicidepreventionlifeline.org. story about you and a shotgun <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's out of infamous maybe uh, i don't know I, i've i think i've shared it a few times when i've told my story but yeah the last night that i drank this um, was the last time it was the last time i yeah. drank um and used mm-hmm. um it was march 19th 2006 i had i had managed to hitchhike from brunswick back to Atlanta and then called a ride from Atlanta to Athens and basically showed up wherever my kid was at at the time and was like, Hey, I'm here. Yeah. I'm ready yeah, to be yeah. a dad, you know, right. but, um, how old was he at that point? He was six months old. Um, you showed up where your son was and you weren't welcome. I wasn't, it wasn't that I wasn't welcome. It was more or less that like I needed to get sober before anybody was going to let me really see my kid. Sure. You know? And, um, and you know, to tell you the truth, I really wasn't done. Like right. I had one more, yeah, yeah, in me. And so that weekend, I uh, I got paid on a Saturday, yeah. And I went to the bar. I went to Tasty World, and I ordered uh, as I used to do when I had money, a little bit of money in my pocket. You know, I started out by ordering a um, probably like a Maker's Mark or something like something fancy, and then. Um, shortly thereafter followed by several tall boys of pbr sure you know yeah yeah and then um and then i just start calling the dope man sure and uh by the end of that evening i was um i was crawling from bush to bush in bethel homes which is a family housing project on the edge of downtown yeah you know um smoking crack and trying to find you know my drug of choice but had some available but not quite yet so um i ended up buying a stolen um shotgun off of a fellow crack enthusiast you know (laughs) and aficionado uh, yeah so i'm like moving this stolen gun from bush to bush while he goes and gets you know talks to the guy and brings me back whatever and i'm like geeked out of my mind yeah and i guess the thought is at this point that like 
when when I run out of money, you know, I'm just going to eat a bullet because I can't do this anymore. Yeah. You know, and uh, what ended up happening is when I ran out of money, I just traded the gun for more crack. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, ended up ended up in a um, pretty bad state that next morning. I mean, I'd been up all night. I had like uninvitedly uh, made my way into a friend's basement and um, let them know the next morning that I was there you know and they weren't happy about that and so ended up getting dropped off at a uh, home depot parking lot and um you know i was like you described i was white as a sheet and covered in sores and probably 120 pounds soaking wet and nothing you know i I had nothing but the clothes on my back and like an old fucking nokia cell phone looked like a it's like the size of a car phone that yeah brick yeah that my yeah. F- family my grandmother was probably paying the bill on yeah just to make sure i was still alive sure you know and um and i i ended up at, as a matter of fact i had to use a pay phone so i don't even think if that was working but i used the pay phone there and i called the guy that had quote unquote offered to help me or be a sponsor and uh and he answered the phone came pick me up took me to his home tried to feed me give me a place to sleep it off but i was not in a state for sleeping yeah yeah he told me later that he thought he was gonna have to knock me out because <laughs> i was like in his kitchen <laughs> doing weird shit you know yeah like trying to scratch everything all at once and right nodding out standing up and it's amazing f- this fellowship you'll take someone out of the home depot parking lot that's in that condition and bring him home because you know that there but for the grace of god go i you know yeah yeah and um that dude did he he saved my life yeah you know he he took me to a a halfway house and um and it was interesting because this this was one of the guys that i had met in the in the hope house that had started his own thing yeah and it didn't last too too long a couple years but um i was the only the second resident there um at the time it was an old sort of like crack house that they were refurbishing and trying to turn it into a recovery home so the power wasn't even on yet but they were cleaning it out and i showed up looking like i was how i really needed to go to detox but um didn't have any options so yeah um and i remember him the the director standing on the porch the guy behind him being the first resident and they're you know the director's talking to me and he's like so you know what's different this time or something to that effect and i was like just you know just tell me what to do i don't give a shit like whatever i'll do anything and i remember the guy standing behind him going like no 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 like please please don't let this dude <laughs> this dude in here like because i look rough yeah yeah um and i don't think anybody really um would have put any money on me staying sober at that point but um man i just did what i was told yeah you know and um i made recovery my number one priority and eventually i was able to have my son back in my life and that was positive reinforcement for me i did have to find a higher power yeah real quick yeah you know um, yeah yeah for me like getting getting sober is um there's a brief window of willingness and opportunity you know for someone like me to actually do some of the work yeah you know and um and i was willing to do it and that's what made the difference for me you know and how long's it been now it'll be 14 years in march march 20th yep i mean it is it seems surreal to me you know it's a totally different life i mean i'm not the same man i was told that the same man will drink again so i'm glad you know um you know, I uh, ended up starting my own business in construction, and you know, I did everything that I could to be a uh, to be a good dad, and you know, have done I think pretty good. You know, I have yeah. My my son is fourteen, and my daughter is you know eleven. My son's been sober longer than I have. I hope. <laughs> Hopefully, he's learned. A little something from his dad's mistakes so hopefully that one won't carry carry on but 
Yeah. Um, I had a parent get sober, and it shortened. I think the no, the amount of time I spent using was significantly reduced because there was already recovery in my in my life. Like there were people I had seen get sober around me, so mm. I I knew I knew when the time came that it was time. Mm. Like I didn't have any illusions about that being impossible because I'd seen it happen over and over all around me. Yeah, you know. Yeah, and I mean, you know, this is a lot. It's been a lot of talk about like what it was like you know for me but i think that like what it's like now um you know when i talked about like a life that has purpose and meaning i mean yes there are things that you know that are huge um for me like being able to be a father be present be able to accept that responsibility not necessarily gracefully but i'm here you know yeah and to be able to have relationships have actual friends you know um but to be of use to um to others just like me yeah. is one of the most fulfilling things that i've experienced that i never would have thought uh, was possible you know when i crawled in um to recovery basically or was delivered i think it, for me it was definitely providence that f for whatever reason i was willing you know yeah um you know it um has given me an opportunity, you know, I, I I was told some things, you know, as far as helping others that were important for me. I mean, uh, w w one man told me that if I wanted to find, find God, go look in the eyes of a newcomer, you know, um, I had a spiritual advisor early on that whenever I had a problem, he just, I'd call him up on the phone and be complaining about some, something. And he'd say, you selfish motherfucker, why don't you go help somebody click? <laughs> <laughs> and I'd be like, damn. You know, I mean, um, but it's true. I mean, I was probably one of two people in a treatment facility who was actually doing the deal. So, you know, there was plenty of opportunities to be of service. Um, yeah. It's changed a lot over the years, you know. Um, you know, I got to a point, like you were sharing, we were talking about earlier, with uh, with codependency and alcoholic relationships where I had to, at some point, I think I had, it was like 2012, so I had about six, six years sober then. And was closer to a drink than I had ever been at that point. And um, it was suggested to me to find a man in Al-Anon and ask him for help. And so yeah. I did that. Yeah. And, you know, the biggest benefit that came out of all of that, and it, I mean, I'm still receiving the benefits, but one of the biggest things that that occurred during that time was i was able to have the best possible relationship i could have with my mother yeah who was still alive at the time yeah yeah in spite of whether she was drinking or not yeah you know alcohol is a symptom drugs are symptom. there's a spiritual disease that's going on yeah you know and i think that it's it's um it's easy to be judgmental you know because of our own fear and bias yeah and um and i was grateful that i did not spend the last few years of her life in that mindset yeah you know i was open to her being a part of my my kids lives and and for her to visit and to spend time with her i have at times wondered could i have done anything differently to support her but and i'm sharing all this because that was a really profound experience for me when she passed you know i was the only i was her next to kin the only next to kin she wasn't married yeah so when she um had a massive heart attack was without oxygen for for quite a while she was no longer with us you know and the end result for her the best possible scenario was you know probably a, a home somewhere you know on machines and um i know it's not what she wanted and i wasn't going to have it so i was able to be of service to her yeah and make that decision for her which was profound for me because Man, I had an experience in all of that where I was in this hospital room with, you know, our family and um, had a big decision to make and had already knew what it was going to be, you know, had it pretty much already made it and um, excused myself to use the restroom. And I was like beating myself up so hard, you know, just like, am I doing the right thing? Am I giving up on her? You know, is this how could, you know. I was abusing myself. Yeah. And I had a thought um, that came to me that was not of me. 
that was basically if you love her the way she loves you then you no longer have the right to do this to yourself anymore and um i mean for me that was a uh it was a spiritual experience it was a little piece of one yeah you know um it's like what is what is grief but the expression of your love you know um after having lost someone you know and so today um i I continue to do what i can to be of service yeah Uh, it's a little different now i'm not as familiar with what the feelings were when i crawled in i think that's why it's important to be there when i walk through the door you know right um the music thing's been interesting I know this is a lot to do with music, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I will say this. It's tough being sober in a heavy metal band, <laughs> yeah. you know? <laughs> but I think that if you can find dudes that accept it, you kind of become the anchor. Yeah, know? it's weird because what I have seen is that um, in entering into a scene where, um, you know, it's it's part of it. So to the extent it's, I mean, it's what you do. You go to these shows and people drink and they you know what i mean and it's like they um you know decompress for me i you know sometimes i I catch shit like at work for for listening to music that i do you know working in construction if you're on a job site and it's somebody else's radio playing nine times out of ten it's either going to be the river or it's going to be some country station if it's in english right right (laughs) (laughs) but yeah you know if you if i work around that I, i mean i just get angry you know, right. but if you put on like German death metal or like French, you know, progressive metal, or I just it's like, oh, it's like right. it's relaxing for me. Right. You know, it's like it's a it's a way to channel that energy out of me. It's a very positive thing for me, which I think is hard for people to understand. Uh, the, the guys that I work with will just have to deal with it. Yeah, you know, because it's it's going to happen. But you're the boss; they they can handle it. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting to um, to try to enter into a scene like that as a sober guy. Yeah, I think a lot of times, guys in the in the in the heavy music scene will experience whatever they experience, and while they're while they're playing the music or are part of that, then they will, you know, if they're fortunate enough, they have that kind of a problem. They will find sobriety then. Yeah, but to enter into it more or less being sober, my experience was it almost seemed like people were a bit suspicious of me. Yeah. You know, it's like it's this idea of uh, maybe I made people uncomfortable you know because i wasn't drinking like right. they were drinking yeah you know and um but all in all it's a pretty pretty tight community and i think that once you know once you pay your dues on a certain level there i mean it's it's very there's a lot of camaraderie sure and people understand and then you find yourself being the guy that people approach when they're experiencing sure their bottoms yeah so, yeah i mean it's um you know it's i wouldn't really wouldn't have it any other way um yeah but man i usually wind these things up with 10 quick questions um that are sort of loosely modeled on the ones at the end of inside the actor studio though mm-hmm. i have my own questions if you're ready we can jump into that sure all right what is the fondest memory you have of a meal that you've had <sighs> of a meal that i had yeah Mm, that's a good one. <laughs> we we talked quite a bit about some dark stuff, so that's what I'm thinking about right now. Yeah. Um, of a meal that I had, fondest memory. I think I think a fond memory, and I couldn't say if it was the the most fondest memory, but. Uh, the last time that I uh, ate breakfast with my mom and my kids was a pretty good memory. She, she, she uh, cooked us all uh, French toast. Oh yeah, yeah, it was nice. Yeah, was that in Dahlonega? She was no, it was there. here. It was here. Yeah, in this house. Oh wow. Yeah. Other than that, I would say the first time I drank a glass of orange juice in rehab, the first time I detoxed. Yeah. And my first taste of orange juice, like after two years of being out there it's yeah. like holy shit <laughs> <laughs> man this is good you know yeah uh, that's funny well second question what's the most frightened you've ever been 
man, the most frightened that I've ever been personally uh, was in Washington, D.C. on a family vacation. And uh, we lost my daughter in the Air and Space Museum. Unintentionally, uh, I thought her grandfather was with her and he thought she was with me and she had wandered into one of the little modules yeah yeah and we were basically leaving at the time and then got outside and was like where's ayla and i was like oh my god like the fear that overcame me in that moment was like nothing i'd ever experienced but fortunately you know it didn't take us long to find her she she was young but she wasn't so young that she didn't know to go to a you know security guard and say hey you know i'm yeah. lost yeah it was pretty scary yeah there was a day after we adopted my daughter it was a hot summer day her mom was somewhere and it was maybe one of the first couple of times where i had her by myself and we were in that little house we used to live in and i turned around i couldn't find her and we live right off a main highway at that point like 15 steps from a road with semi trucks and like Mm. And I turned the house upside down, and I've never experienced fear like that in my life. I, I and like this, I, I've talked a lot about how I felt enormous emotional, like brain chemistry changes in the first weeks that we had our daughter. I didn't have the full nine months of gestation, and then and then infanthood and toddlerhood. I mean, I just got a twenty five month year old kid. And all that shit happened in like 72 hours. It was really intense. Mm -hmm. And then one day I couldn't find her. And it turned out that she had gone outside and gotten in the cab of my truck. It probably took me all of seven minutes to find her. But it was the worst seven minutes of my adult yeah. life. Just like. Unbelievable. Every, every bit of mortal terror. Like yeah. a fate. I, I thought that the most frightened I'd ever been up to that point was that I might die. And then like that all changed that suddenly there was something even more terrifying than death and that would be mm -hmm. like having to lose your amazing little angelic child it was horrible mm -hmm. it is cool to um to be able to live a life where you actually care about something more than yourself though you know what i mean and i'm saying that for me yeah me too the other side of that coin yeah you know but yeah that's scary shit yeah yeah of all the things in your life that you've lost what is the thing that you regret losing the most time yeah yeah that good that period from um you know 14 to 25 you know some good years some good opportunities that i mean i say that however it took all that to make me who i am today so yeah. to honor that and that journey then it was necessary however who wouldn't who wouldn't like to have some time back yeah and know what you know now yeah so yeah tell me about a time you received an act of kindness from a stranger hmm that man I would say the most profound act of kindness that I received from a stranger was when um, the uh, and this is going to be kind of weird but the, the first man that took the time with me in the program um, or I should probably say the, f the first time that a man in recovery took the time um, to sit down with me and walk me through some of this spiritual work. Yeah. You know, was, I don't know if it was random, but it was an act of kindness and love. Um, and I certainly was a stranger. Yeah. Because I didn't even know myself. Yeah. You know, so how could anyone else know me? But that's, that's, that was the key for me. Yeah. You know, so. What's your favorite place to gig? Favorite place to gig? Man, I do enjoy playing the Caledonia. It's a great bar. It is. Uh, the people, you know, 
um i have enjoyed the one time i played the jinx was a lot of fun yeah um we played with black tusk we opened for their album release party so it was and it was like a friday i think man i had never seen such a positive response to heavy music in a in a smaller town like that like yeah the turnout was was awesome and um you know it's because you know those guys in that scene you know the town loves them for that and um you know it uh it was just interesting though i remember going outside after the show and it was like it was like downtown athens right except it was like gothic art school girls and i was like holy shit <laughs> savannah what the hell yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh man i've been in athens but anyway yeah. you know yeah that was funny uh visa and income considerations aside if you could live anywhere in the world where would you live iceland i've never been there at least in the warmer months yeah i can't speak on the winter side but i've visited and man it's like being on another planet yeah yeah it's beautiful and it's untouched you know yeah and um very forward thinking yeah you know um I mean, it's a cool place. I mean, they basically fired and rehired their government right. on their own in like a period of two weeks, from what I understood. <laughs> right. You know, like enough of y'all. Yeah. You're fired. You're, you're going to jail. All right. Yeah. Online election. Right. You know. So. They seem to have a lot of things figured out there. Yeah. And it's not much bigger than Athens. Honestly, population wise, it is, I think, just a little bit larger. Huh. Yeah. It's not a lot of people there and they like it that way. Yeah. Yeah, I mean they they want people to visit, spend money, but mm -hmm. it's very hard to become a citizen, from what I understand. Huh. I didn't know that. Yeah. Do you have an ideal musical instrument, and if so, do you already own it or not? Yeah. Uh, man, when I was first playing music before I really got into um, stuff, was uh, I was probably about thirteen or fourteen, and I saw a. Um, I went to a music store with my dad and I didn't even see the actual guitar. I just saw a book of guitars. Yeah. It had a um, 80s uh, Les Paul Custom in it. And for whatever reason, I was like, that's that's the one. Yeah. You Cold know? top or? Um, I think it was a Silver Burst. Yeah. Yeah. Now you, but have was, a, you have a Silver Burst, don't you? Oh, yeah. Is it 80? Mm-hmm. So you went and found that guitar and now you own it man i found a couple of them and uh, you know beyond my means eventually i had to part ways with them to pay the bills but sure i managed to get one and hold on to it for a while yeah i have a feeling one day those guitars are going to be worth a lot of money yeah they already are on a certain level but, but one there's day. something special about the silver burst for you yeah uh, well that just because i saw that you know and it just rang right. a bell for me in memory but i will say this that i also have a black beauty and um a 79 custom yeah and um man if it came down to it that 79 is that's my one that's the one yeah yeah it's just it's just something about those old and people are not a lot of people um you know get down on the norland years man but i would put some good norland guitars against anything gibson's ever made yeah yeah absolutely maple neck flute yeah you know is there an instrument that you've had to let go of, either from a uh, pawn or theft or having to sell or that you deeply wish you could get back? Hmm. Man, you know i got a gear problem, right? <laughs> 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 oh, well, how short could this answer be? Um, man. Do you, so, actually, no. I mean, there are. I'm sure there's plenty of stuff I would love to have back. Yeah but the one that got away i got i ended up getting back which is what was my black beauty my 79 custom yeah i sold it in like 2012 2011 yeah. and two years later i hit that guy up and was like hey man you still got that guitar and he was like yeah i do and he's i said well would you consider selling it back to me he was like sure if you want to pay 20 percent." and i was like run it yeah so um other than that i would say like some of the stuff that i lost when i was a kid like, it would be cool to have my first electric guitar again what was that guitar it was a, a studio les paul yeah i mean just to have it if nothing else give it to my kid you yeah know? um i had a cool drum set it was a pearl session yeah it's a pretty good drum set yeah yeah 
um, ended up pawning that one. Yeah. You know? It happens. Yeah. So you do or do not currently own a Silver Burst? I do. Okay. That's what I thought. Yeah. Don't so tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> if you could be a guest with any artist for one song at a show, what would be this song and what would be the artist? Mm. Hey, would you sing or just play guitar? Or? Mm. That's tough. <sighs> Man, if I could pull it off, I would love to play. I mean, this is a fan, you know, I mean, this is, you know, if it were, if I was ever at a level where I was, you know, had the opportunity to join a band like Gojira. Yeah. On stage. Yeah, yeah. I would love to play a guitar, you know, riff, or I would love to play guitar on one of their songs. I've seen those guys a couple of times and they are by far the tightest heavy band I have ever seen. Yeah. You know, and the energy is positive, which I think is um, remarkable for that kind of music because a lot of times it's not. Yeah. I mean, it can have a cathartic expression, but to be a positive message within that um, level of, emotion i think is is powerful yeah you know a particular song or just any i would i mean if if i could figure out how to play one right that right you know yeah <laughs> if I could, that'd be the hard part yeah you know getting the right hand up to speed but yeah yeah pretty much anything in that regard yeah so last question if you could imagine a taxi that can go anywhere in space or time mm-hmm. and you climb into this taxi you say to the driver hey man take me home where is home? Are you talking about death? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, I don't. I don't really have a preferred time and space, yeah. other than right here, right now. Yeah. I mean, I think that to try to focus on any one point in time is is on a certain level discounting um, everything that's occurred since. You know, um, I think anywhere where my children are and the people that I care about are. Yeah. You know is home for me it's yeah. it's, a, it's a funny question because when you think of home you think of a place yeah you know um and you know i certainly feel that i had a home a, a decent home as a child i had it better than i think some people do maybe not as good as others but um i wouldn't really take take a lot of that back for what i have now yeah you know yeah um, I think that answered the question. I mean, you're not the first person to say wherever my kids are is home. Yeah. You know, yeah. there was a time when I would have said my grandparents' house in the years when things were most chaotic and tumultuous in my family, like my nuclear family, being at my grandparents' house was the safest I felt and the most cared for. And that always felt like home to me, but now it's kind of wherever my my wife and daughter are is home to me. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, that's it, man. Yeah, I mean, really, man. This is um, this has been amazing. It's been a really good talk, and I'm really grateful you're able to do it. Yeah, man. Thank you for the opportunity. You know. Yeah. I love you, man. Love you too. All right, that's episode 53. Man, I'm so tired. It's almost 4 o'clock in the morning. We've been working on this all night because I wanted to get this out as close to, like, just past the deadline as possible. But 
I'm wiped out. Um, thanks, to Jake Kreger. He and I just got off the phone about two hours ago. He's driving home from a gig in Virginia, and and he wanted to like, hey, where's the episode, man? And I was like, hey, sorry, man. And I told him the whole story that I told at the top of the show, and he was like, wow, that's crazy. I'm like, I know. Anyway, um, crazy weekend. Uh, thanks, Jake. He's our producer. You know, he sends me show notes after every show to tell me what I did right and what I did wrong. And, and thanks to him, the show gets a little better every week. So thanks, Jake. I also want to thank Gene Wolfolk and The Powder Room. The Powder Room is the band that supplies all the music for Crash and Ride. The music in the intro, the little bumper, what you're hearing under my voice right now is all from The Powder Room's first two records. You can find them at thepowderroom.bandcamp.com. I think they're a really great band. You should definitely throw them a few bucks and download some of their music. Uh, Gene Wolfolk, the main writer and singer for The Powder Room, has a new band called Dream Tent. That's D-R-E-A-M-T-E-N-T dot bandcamp dot com. Dream Tent dot bandcamp dot com. Gene's new stuff is really different and really exciting, and I think they're headed for great things, so go check it out. I'd like to thank Heil Audio for these two PR40 microphones I've started using for the podcast. Man, I'm tired. Oh, my God, I'm stumbling over my words. Um, Heil Audio gave me these mics at a, at a really nice discount because they really believed in what I was doing. But, man, I'm so stoked about them. I can't stop talking about them. I used to use the PR40 on snare drum, kick drum, and bass cabinet in the studio. Now I've learned they're great broadcast mics. If you're thinking about upgrading the microphones for your podcast, I'd highly suggest the Heil PR40. Oh, my God, I'm so close to climbing into bed and finally going to sleep. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening. Um, I'll try to get another episode out in a timely manner this week. But until we speak again, take care of yourself. Be kind to yourself. Ask for help if you need it. Go see live music. Support your favorite band. And remember, loud guitars save lives. <laughs>